This is where a lot of people get it twisted. Trying to say, well, Paul is speaking of himself as a Christian, but we know better. Because he's speaking in the present tense, right? Well, first of all, to say Paul was speaking in the present tense, we'll deal with that in a minute. But to use that just shows your love for sin. Because if you just read from verse 1 in chapter 7 all the way up until 14, as we just did now, you know the context. He's speaking to those, start off at verse 1, for I speak to them that know the law. He's been talking about the law. Hi. Today I want to talk about Romans chapter 7, or more specifically Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 25. It has been said about Romans 7 that it is one of the most famous chapters in the Bible. It is one of the best known chapters in the Word of God, one of the most controversial chapters in the Bible, or one of the most disputed and complex chapters, or even formidable and frightening. Now I don't think that Romans chapter 7 is very frightening, it doesn't have to be controversial. But um, I've always thought that it was unanimous throughout professing Christianity that Romans chapter 7 was the chapter where we learn about Paul's inner struggle with sin um, as a believer. But um, it shouldn't surprise me uh, that pretty much every verse in the Bible has been and can be or will be taken out of context to teach false doctrine and heresy. So it wasn't until recently... Um, a brother introduced me to a false teacher named TrueCore08, who I will put at the beginning of this video. And um, I found out by watching his video that there are some who teach that Romans chapter 7 is not, speak, is, is not Paul speaking as a saved person, but is speaking as someone who is unsaved. Um, so this true core 08 guy i have learned through various videos of his that he is some kind of a sinless perfectionist and um, you know this is the same thing with open theism um they teach that once that you're saved that you no longer sin at all and uh, of course that's not what the bible teaches so i'm sure that there are those uh, you know i've seen kerrigan skelly teaches this um I can't think of the guy's name, Mike Desario, that Holding Firmly guy teaches this. Of course, Jesse Morrell teaches this. So um, they're all going to try to say that Romans chapter 7 is speaking of someone who isn't saved. And that's not true. So after I discovered this, I did some research on Google and I found a very good article that was already put together um, with arguments from both sides um, to see, you know, what chapter 7 is really trying to teach. And so I'm going to go over that. Um, first, I'm just going to go through these uh, verses in Romans chapter 7, 7 through 25, and just kind of do a little bit of an expository study. And I want to talk about some figures of speech that are used in them. And then I'm going to go over the arguments uh, back and forth from both sides. You know, is it speaking of someone who's saved or who isn't saved? Um, so, I guess I will just start going over Romans chapter 7, verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? So there's been a lot of things said about the law, um, God's law, throughout Romans, and even right before this verse. Um, so, you know, Romans chapter 3, verse 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay? The law can't save anybody. Okay? All the law does is show everyone that, that they are guilty of sin, guilty of breaking God's commandments. Um, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, okay, not the way of salvation, like false teachers like Robert Breaker, Brian Denlinger, etc. Hyper dispensationalists teach that people could be saved by the law in the Old Testament. They completely have no understanding. I have no reason to believe that they are regenerate because the text couldn't be more plain. Um, which another thing that I forgot to say at the beginning here, those who teach that Romans chapter 7 is uh, not speaking of a saved person, um, through the, throughout this passage in particular, you know, that we're going to be covering. Um, those who teach sinless perfection, that, that a person no longer sins after they're saved, uh, that it's possible to be sinlessly perfect or whatever, 
There's no reason to believe that they are saved, because the Bible specifically says in 1 John 1, 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So according to the Bible, those who say that they have no sin, uh, True Core, OA, Jesse Morrell, etc., um, you know, and this is speaking, you know, of a sin nature um, that they deny. So there's no reason to believe that they're saved. Um, so I have no problem at all with making a video titled that Jesse Morrell will burn in hell forever because that's what the Bible says. Um, those who teach that they have no sin, they believe they have no sin, they deceive themselves, the truth is not in them. So anyway, um, there was a lot said about the law. The law uh, can never justify anybody, uh, contrary to what others try to teach. The Bible completely says otherwise. Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay, It's always been by grace through faith. No other way. Romans 4, 13, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So again, the promise made from God to Abraham was not through keeping the deeds of the law, uh, but it was through the righteousness which is through, through faith. It's by grace through faith. Um, Romans 4.15, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. And it just blows my mind that Robert Breaker is so ignorant, and people who watch him and get on my channel and try to defend him, and there's like a hundred dislikes, which absolutely, you know, means nothing to me, besides the fact that, you know, broad is the path that leads to destruction, which the Bible says. But, you know, how could somebody look at the law worketh wrath and have so lack of understanding to say that this means that those who try to keep the law of their own righteousness are angry? Okay, it obviously means that it works God's wrath, okay? Because by nature, um, everyone is born with a sinful nature. And by nature, everyone is a child of disobedience, okay? A child of God's wrath. That is what it means the law works God's wrath, because all that men can do is break the law. Okay? It's absolute nonsense what Robert Breaker teaches. But anyways, Romans 7, 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Okay, so now we're into chapter 7, saying that you are dead to the law by the body of Christ. Romans 7, 5, for when, we, for when in the flesh the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Okay? When we were in flesh the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So by the law, it arouses a, a man's sins to become more active. Um, Romans 7 verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So, delivered from the law. So, I go over these things. It says the law, the law can't justify anybody. The promise wasn't by the law. If they were, were of the law, be heirs. Faith would be made void. Uh, the law worketh wrath. Um... You know, we're dead to the law, and we're delivered from the law. And, and it says the motions of sins which were by the law. So when it says, so then it gets to the point to where, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? It's like, you know, what? It sounds like the law is some evil, wicked thing that's of the devil. You know, is the law sin? Um, also, we could have here a metonymy, which means, uh, it, it means a change of noun. Okay, a change of one noun for another related noun. And I usually spell metonymy wrong. Uh, it's metonymy, M-E-T-O-N-Y-M-Y. Okay, so it's a change of one noun for another related noun. And in this specific case, in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, we have the effect of the effect for the thing or action causing or producing it. Okay, the effect uh, for the thing or the action causing or producing it. So so it could mean, you know, is the effect of the law sin? Okay, does the law cause sin? 
And Paul says, God forbid, absolutely not. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Okay. The law is not sin, neither is the effect of the law sin. The law is holy and just, like verse 12 says. So verse 12 is pretty much the answer to verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Verse 12, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. The law is like a mirror, okay? It makes sin known, like a mirror makes dirt known. You know, our face can be really dirty. We could have a big zit on there, and if it's not painful or something, we don't know until we look in the mirror, and then it's like, wow, uh, we see that. And so, so the law is like a mirror. It, it shows men their sin. It shows men their sinful nature, that they are sinful, that they are guilty of sin. And uh, or you can think of it as like rays of sunlight. The law is rays of sunlight. Uh, you see dust particles and stuff that you don't normally see. Um, you know the, the idea of the mirror is better. But uh, but you know Romans chapter Romans chapter three verse twenty. You know really shows us that the law is like a mirror because it says, "For by the law is the knowledge of sin." Okay. And that's what he said here in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, till the law came, you know, then I knew what lust was, okay, because it said, thou shalt not covet, the tenth commandment. Um, Paul was ignorant of his sin until confronted with the law. The God-ordained role of the law in a fallen world is to reveal the nature of human sin. It not only defines sin, but acts as a catalyst provoking the precise sinful reactions that it forbids and condemns. Did Paul arbitrarily select this particular command, uh, you know, thou shalt not covet? Uh, most think not. Paul likely selected the command against coveting because coveting is a foundational sin, as sin at its root is, is a desire to do what self wants more than what God wants. Not surprisingly, Paul elsewhere in Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5 equates covetousness with idolatry. Okay. Um, also, we see here what, I'm not going to probably pronounce some of these figures of speech correctly, but prolepsis, prolepsis is answering of an argument by anticipating it before it's used. Okay. Um, anyways, let's go on to verse 8. It says, But the sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of consupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. So, consupiscence is just another word for lust or desire, again. Okay, so don't let that throw you off. But sin taking occasion by the commandment. Okay, um, so he says, you know, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Uh, he says, God forbid, absolutely not. You know, but verse 8, but sin. Sin is the real culprit. Okay, now when he says sin taking occasion by the commandment, the commandment is the tenth commandment, what he just said, thou shalt not lust. So when that commandment came to his, you know, to his consciousness, he, you know, he was made aware of that. Um, then it wrought in him all manner of lust or desire, uh, immoral, ungodly lust, for without the law, sin was dead. Um, so, the evil proclivity of the fallen human heart lies dormant until God's commands or prohibitions specify boundaries, at which time latent rebellion springs into defiant action. Okay, so when it says that, um, for without the law, sin was dead, um, well, when he says, for without the law, he means before the commandment came. Because in verse 9, he says, um, but when the commandment came. So this was before the commandment came, sin was dead, meaning it was inactive or it showed little action. It was unexcited, inoperative. It's like a snake coiled up, sleeping in the sun until you poke it with a stick. Okay, and then you see, wow, that thing is alive. Okay, the law arouses and incites sin. So, let's continue to verse 9. Verse 9 says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay, and we kind of have the same ideas going on here. Um, Paul was once alive apart from the law, meaning that there was a time 
when he was living in a state of blissful indifference to the intensely searching demands that the law, law made. A state of complacent self-assurance. Okay, that's what it means when he says, I was alive without the law. Okay, he was in a, in, in a state of complacent, complacent self-assurance. For Paul, there was a time when ignorance was truly bliss. It should be understood that Paul wasn't really alive. All since the fall are born in a state of spiritual death, but merely thought that he was. That is, until this commandment came, it came home to his consciousness, or hit home, giving his sin nature a chance to come alive. Sin came, became alive and slayed his cheerful assumption of innocence, his misconception that he was spiritually alive, and then he died. Okay, Then he understood that he was guilty and that the punishment for sin is death. Um, Paul felt undisturbed, unconvicted, not realizing the great death sentence that he was under. Everything seemed fine. Sin came to life again, lived again. Um, so, you know, Paul suddenly realized that he was a lawbreaker, and lawbreakers deserve death. Thus, the law is called the ministration of death and the ministration of condemnation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 and 9. God's holy law convicts and slays the sinner. Okay, again, here we have a metonymy which is one noun put for another. In this specific, um, specific instance, it is where what is said to be done is put for what is declared. So it says, when the commandment came, this means when its power was declared in revealing my impotence to obey it, I, in my experience, suffered its penalty, death. Okay, so where what is being done is being put for what is declared to be done. Okay. And when I saw this, this figure of speech being used here, I saw underneath it some other interesting um, verses, some, other extra, some interesting explanations that I thought that I would share here because I always, you know, mix into my teachings the refuting the hyper-dispensational heresy, um, which I already have, but in this video. Um, but Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Before faith came, and I know that this could be something that hyper-dispensationalists use, before faith came. See, they were saved by works in the Old Testament. Faith hadn't came yet. <laughs> but, you see, uh, this is a metonymy. Um, before the gospel was declared and brought a new object for faith. Okay, It's not that they weren't saved by grace through faith, because that's the only way that anyone ever was saved or ever will be. It means a new object for faith, okay? So, and then James chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works, okay? So remember, this is a metonymy. It's where what is said to be done is put for what is declared, okay? Um, was not Abraham our father justified by works, this means he declared to be justified, okay? And so Romans chapter or James chapter two verse twenty two by works was faith made, um, was it declared to be or manifested to be perfect, um, true meaning true and sincere, okay? Declared to be. It's not talking about you know justification by God. That's only by faith. Um, so, anyways, let's move along here. Romans chapter 7, verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be death. Okay, it was ordained to be life. We find out in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 and 17, and Luke chapter 10, verse 28, 25 through 28. People come to Jesus, they say, you know, what must I do to have eternal life? And he says, keep the commandments. So basically the idea is if you can keep the commandments, but you have to keep them perfectly, you know, your whole life. And in that way you could get eternal life. But since we're all sinful by nature, then that's completely impossible. So, um... The law or the, the commandment um, 
being said here in verse 10, representative for the whole law. Uh, theoretically, the law could only give life theoretically. Theoretically, because uh, in actuality, the law could not give life because human sinfulness, uh, Romans chapter 8, Galatians 3, 21, um, it could have given life if kept perfectly, which was to result in life. Uh, it actually gave death, proved to result in death due to human sinfulness. Um, you know, all become guilty by the law. Okay, Romans chapter 3, verse 29. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Okay, the exact opposite of what hyper-dispensational hyper heretics teach, that people were saved by the law. No, it, it only, you know, shows that they are guilty. Um, so, verse 11, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Okay, um, once again he says, But sin. Um, you know, sin is the culprit. Um, not the law. And uh, sin used the law as a base from which to launch an attack against him, taking an opportunity through the commandment. That's what that means. So, so deceptive is sin, for sin deceived me. Um, just like uh, Eve was deceived in the Garden of Eden, that it can actually take a good thing, the law, taking an opportunity through the commandment and use it against us to slay us. Okay, It's interesting to note that um, deceived, you know, the same reference to Eve being deceived by Satan in the garden. And likewise, Satan used a good thing, God's command to Adam and Eve, and against Adam and Eve to slay them spiritually. Now verse 12, Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Okay, the law reflects God's character. Um, verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Okay, God forbid. Absolutely not. The law does not bring death. Sin does. Um, James, verse 15, chapter 1, verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived... It bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the law does not bring sin, death does. Um, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. Exceeding sinful. So, sin uses that which is good again the law magnified sin okay and we have another figure of speech here this one's pretty interesting and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it right but it's called antanaclasis antanaclasis or word clashing it's the use of the same word in the same sentence in two different senses okay and so it says sin, but sin that it might appear sin. In the former place, sin is used of the old nature, while in the later it is used of its real sinful nature and character. Okay. So sin that it might appear as it really is. Okay, and it's, and it's real character. So two different senses, the same word sin is being used with, with two different senses in the same sentence. That's called antanaclasis or word clashing. And I think that there's even maybe another more interesting usage of that later on. So, I hope that you'll try to memorize some of these basic uh, figures of speech, and I have them on my website, etc.beconverted.com, and uh, if you go to the study and Bible interpretation, figures of speech, and that's some, a section that definitely needs work on, but over time, uh, I'll add a lot to that. Um, but let's go to verse 14 now. So, there's actually kind of a transition here in verse, verse 17 through verse 17 through 13, or verse, I mean, sorry, verse 7 through 13, or verse 7 through the beginning of verse 14, and then 14 down to 25. Um, there's a little bit of a change there. 
and uh, we'll talk about that later, I guess. But I'll keep going for now. Verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is spiritual. It is of the Spirit. It is holy. It is just. It is of God. You know, and this makes me think of, you know, the spiritual man judgeth all things. And I love that verse, especially when there's some lost person or some professing Christian that will come up to you and say, Judge not, lest you be judged. You know, and they say, Well, the spiritual man judgeth all things. You know, or who are you to judge? Well, the spiritual man... You know, or he who is spiritual judges all things. <laughs> so that kind of throws them off. But um, for we know that the law is spiritual. Okay. But I am carnal, sold under sin. Now here's the verse where a lot of people would get mixed up on, or they, that these false, you know, sinless perfection heretics try to take out of context. You know, but I am carnal, sold under sin. What does this really mean? Okay, does this mean that Paul was living carnally? He was a carnal Christian. You know that he's in bondage to sin. Um, what does this mean? Um, well. When he says, you know, I am carnal, he's talking about his condition as a human being. Uh, we are all carnal by nature. We are all born and conceived in sin. Like, um, like David said in Psalm 51, I think. Um, you know, in sin my mother conceived me. It doesn't mean that she, you know, had an affair when he was born, you know. Um, it means that, that by nature all are children of disobedience, the children of wrath. We are all born with a sinful nature. And so that's what it means when it says that he is carnal. It means the condition, okay, not a position. It doesn't mean that he's, he's living carnally as a Christian. Okay, that's, that's in a different sense, like the, the Christians in Corinth were carnal. Um, no, he's saying, I am carnal, you know, I was conceived in sin and I was sold under sin. Well, he is only so far under the mastership of sin as that he is still in the body, which is by reason of sin, still mortal and still a stronghold of temptation. As regards a claim on the soul to condemnation, he is free from sin. As regards to its influence, its temptations, he is liable. And such is now his view of holiness, that the presence of these, and the least yielding to them, is to him a heavy servitude. To the question, when he was thus sold, we answer, at the fall and in Adam. Okay, so this being sold under sin doesn't mean that he's currently, you know, in bondage to sin. It means, you know... Since the beginning of the fall, human nature, every human, was sold under sin. And uh, so, and this old nature is still with him. And uh, we see uh, another figure of speech called metastasis, or counter blame, transferring the blame from one thing to another. So, you know. I am carnal, sold under sin. You know, blaming blaming this, his his human nature. And it's not that he is um, transferring the blame, though. Actually, it's that he is... Uh, oh, I don't know how I said it. Um, it's like he's differentiating, you know, um, his new self and his old self. And I guess we'll see that later, too. Um, verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not for what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that I do, okay? Or that I hate, I do not approve of, okay? I do not approve of these things that I'm doing. Verse 17, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Not I, but sin. This is an indication that Paul is writing from a saved person's perspective. The sinful self is not his real self. Paul was a new man in Christ, but the old man was responsible for the sin. Paul is not trying to get out a personal responsibility for his actions, but he is distinguishing between the two natures, as he also does in verse 20. Okay. I had to make sure that the sound was actually on the microphone because that would be bad if I got this far and it wasn't, but it is, so 
Praise God. Um, so see, he's not actually putting the blame or not taking responsibility for this, but he's distinguishing between to the two natures, as he does in verse 20, as we'll see again. So, you know, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So, you know, he wants to do good, but he fails sometimes because of his old self that is still with him and that is with all believers. Um, verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Um, that is my flesh, another hint that Paul is writing from the saved perspective of a saved person, not an unregenerate. Paul had to make this parenthetical clarification because he knew that apart from his sinful flesh, there was something, someone good dwelling in him. Um, so he says, for I know that in me, and then, you know, in parentheses, that is in my flesh, making this distinction here that, you know, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but I do have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in me, and that is good and righteous and holy. So, um, and here we see that something just as common as metonymy. Metonymy is real common all over the Bible, you know, where I've said that it's changed for a noun for another noun. And so we have synecdoche, which is really close to metonymy, but it's the change of an idea for another associated idea. Okay, so this is the change of ideas. And um, to find is used for to receive or to obtain. So in verse 18 it says, uh, that which is good I find not. It means that it's not present with me. Okay. So that would be synecdoche. Now I don't really have any notes for verse 19 down to 22. So I'll read through them. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Okay, which is pretty much the exact same thing we read in verse 17. Now then, it is I no more that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Again, not to transfer the blame, not to take responsibility for his own actions, but to make the distinction between, you know, his new nature and his old nature. So, verse 21, I find that a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Okay. And in this sense, he says, I find a law. I think that it's, it's, it's like a rule, like, um, you know, like the law of gravity or something. You know, when this happens, this will happen. You know, so he's saying, when I see, you know, I see a law that, you know, when I, when I, would do good, evil is right there with me. And so, and this makes me think of in Job, you know, the whole sons of God thing, how the sons of God are men and not angels, but, um, you know, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came among them. You know, it's like he's right there when they are, you know, presenting themselves before the Lord. It's just, it reminds me exactly of that, you know. Um, Evil is always lurking its ugly head right there. Um, and so verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And that will be brought up later. But let's go to verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So this is where we have the antanaclasis or the word clashing again. And it's more interesting here, I think. This figure of speech, antanaclasis. Um, Okay, so in the first and third places, the word law refers to the old nature, which is indwelling sin, because it once lorded over him, though now it only struggles to usurp again. In the second, it refers to the divine law, or the new nature implanted in him, which is contrary to the former and contests its claims. So, but I see another law in my members, the old nature. The indwelling sin, warring against the law of my mind, the new nature, um, and bringing me into captivity to the old nature, the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay, so I hope that you understand that. Um, I 
I have another one, another figure of speech here is catachresis. I don't know exactly how that's pronounced, but it's also, also you can take it as incongruity. It's one word changed for another only remotely connected to it. The meanings are remotely the same. Okay, I see another law in my members. He means that he sees sin, which through the authority with which it rules his members, he calls it by, he calls it law. Okay, through the authority with which it rules his members. Um, so, Okay, we'll just continue here. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of, from the body of this death? Okay, um, this is not a cry of despair, but of desire, for Paul knows the answer, which we see in the next verse. Um... Now, there's another figure of speech I'm not sure how to pronounce, but it's anti-Maria, anti-Maria, I don't know. One part of a speech for another, a noun for a verb, a verb for a noun, etc. In this case, it's a noun for an adjective, and so this dying, so, so the body of this death means this dying body or mortal body, okay, this mortal body. Um, then we have another a figure of speech called a hypolage, an interchange of construction. So this mortal dying body, not until this mortal body shall die or be changed and glorified, shall the saints be delivered from their conflict between the old and the new natures. It cannot be accomplished by vows or resolutions or by discipline, which is the fond idea and aim of all those who are ignorant of this teaching. Okay, those who deceive themselves, who do not have the truth in them, who deny that they sin, you know. Um, so there's another figure of speech here. We see this as an ex exclamation, you know, oh wretched man that I am. Um, it's an expression of feeling by way of exclamation. Um, you know, it concludes the whole chapter. Um, this verse expresses the continuous experience of every true child of God who understands the conflict between the two natures. The old man and the new and the new man, the flesh and the spirit, the old nature and the divine nature, implanted within him by the Holy Spirit. Okay. This conflict is the one thing is the one thing of which a merely religious person is destitute. It is the one thing that cannot be imitated by the hypocrite. He never has an abiding sense of inward corruption and of conflict with it because he has not the new nature which is by alone, which alone it is manifested and brought to light. He has no standard within him to detect it or wish to try it. Until the truth of the abiding conflict between the two natures is seen, no spiritual peace can be enjoyed. The fruits of the old tree are dealt with in the former portion of this doctrinal part of the epistle, Romans chapter 1, 16 through chapter 5, verse 11. And then the old tree itself is dealt with in chapter 5, verse 12 through 8, verse 39. And is shown to be in God's sight as dead, having been crucified with Christ. Thus the conflict goes on till this body of death, until this dying body, either dies or is changed at Christ's appearing. Then the longing desire will be realized and faith will be rewarded as expressed in the words that follow where the ellipsis must be supplied um, you know I thank God he will deliver me and wrecking myself now even now as already having died with Christ I thank God he will deliver me through Jesus Christ our Lord so an ellipsis is very common too, and that's when you know a word or, or a phrase is removed to usually to emphasize another part of the sentence. And a lot of times in the King James Bible, they filled in the ellipses in the Greek, and those are the italicized words. But uh, they didn't always fill them in, and you know that's on purpose sometimes. So. Um, you know, I mean, I, I believe that the King James Bible is inspired, preserved Word of God, so it's fine as it is, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still ellipses um, 
that we can see. So when it says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, you know, it's like, I thank God He shall deliver me, okay? We know that that's implied there. It doesn't say that, but, you know, by way of ellipsis. Um, so the focus is on God, you know, not, not, the focus is on that He's the one that does it, not not the focus is on what he's going to do or what he has done. Um, so, uh, so we have another figure of speech in verse 24, erotesis, I don't know, interrogating, uh, asking questions without waiting for answers. Okay. By these figures, the height of Christian experience emphasized the knowledge of sin the knowledge of the fact as to what God had done with sins and also as to what he had done with sin so that although the fruits of the old tree are still seen or mourned over there is the blessed knowledge that God reckons it as dead as having died with Christ and that we are to reckon the same now let's move on to verse 25, the final one here. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with, my, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Okay, this is kind of similar to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. It says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, so I, as I said, we have the figure of speech ellipsis here, where a phrase is removed to emphasize on something else. So the emphasis is on God. He's the one who delivers, but, you know, so that's why, you know, the actual action, you know, of his deliverance is removed there. Um, the deliverance here desired is from the conflict between the old nature and the new, the flesh and the spirit. But as the flesh is bound up with this body of death, or this dying body, or this mortal body, there is no deliverance except either through death and resurrection, or, though, or through that change which shall take place at the coming of Christ. The old heart is not changed or taken away, but, at, but a new heart is given. And these two are contrary one to the other. They remain together and must remain until God shall deliver us from the burden of this sinful flesh, this mortal body, by a glorious resurrection like unto Christ. This deliverance is further described in Romans chapter 8, verse 11 and 23. And it is through Jesus that our mortal bodies shall be raised again. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation or full deliverance from this body and death by means of or through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, wow. I hope that you got something out of that. That was me going through Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 25. Just kind of an expository verse by verse. I know it's kind of choppy and stuff, but I hope that you got something out of that. But that's only part of the study. Okay, the next part is we're going to examine some things. We're going to examine arguments that are used to try and support that, that this passage is speaking of an unbeliever. And we're going to look at the other arguments that teach that this is Paul speaking as a Christian, which is the true sense that is given here. Uh, but let's see. Uh, you know, again, as I said, I want to remind you, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And I do believe that this is speaking of you know, a sin nature. You know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because all by nature are the children of wrath or the children of disobedience. Um, you know, just like David said, he was conceived, his mother conceived him in sin. Um, so it is totally wrong to say, it's totally wrong for a Christian to say that they are without sin. Now, it's another thing for a Christian to call themselves a sinner. I don't believe that's biblical. Every time the Bible talks about a sinner, it's talking about a lost person, and that's really for another study. And there are some verses that people might, you know, get confused about or misinterpret, and I should do that soon. But so to say, to a Christian to say that they are without sin, would be unbiblical, and they would be the truth would not be in them according to the Bible. Um, but for a Christian to say that they are still a sinner is completely unbiblical, and people could say that's just semantics. It's just you know a matter of terms or whatever. And yeah, in some sense it is, but 
I think that is also very crucial, especially when we got easy believism heretics like James Patel. He says, you're born a sinner, you'll die a sinner. Well, if you're born a sinner and you die a sinner, then you're going to die and go to hell because there was no uh, new birth. Okay, there was, there was no time of being born again in between there. Okay, once a person is born again, you must be born again to inherit the kingdom of God. And once a person is born again, there is a new nature, there is a change. They will bear fruit. Um, they will live holy. Um, that's another thing, easy believism, easy believism heretics, they try to say, you know, that, that verse in Hebrews that says, without holiness no man shall see the Lord. And they try to make that justification. Once you're justified, you're holy in the eyes of God. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about sanctification. It says, follow peace with all men. We're talking about how you live your life. Okay, if there, once you're justified, there will be sanctification. Okay, um, so... There are, there are these changes, and so once you're saved, you're now a saint, and you do live holy. And you know, there, and it might be hard for us to say, well, I don't really feel like I live holy or whatever, but we need to realize if you truly are saved, then you are living holy. That's what the Bible says. Okay, when you, were, when you weren't saved, you had no care about the Bible or God's Word, you know... Um, you know, whatever, you, you weren't living holy. Now you are, even though we, we don't live 100% perfectly holy... No, we don't. Um, we do have struggles, like Paul in Romans chapter 7. But we are not sinners. Okay, by that term, we are not sinners. So somebody says, you know, you're, you know, everybody's a sinner, you know. I would, I would correct them, and I would say, you know, I was a sinner, then I got saved. You know, I'm a saint, I live holy. You're a sinner, you need to repent of your sins. Okay, um, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you're going to be facing the judgment here. So, uh, but whatever, that's something else. So, it, so just remember that you know it's wrong to say that we are without sin, but it's also wrong if you're born again to say that you're a sinner, because that means that you're living a continual lifestyle of sin. That's talking about unregenerate person. Anyways, um, so there's kind of a theme here, at least from. You can say Romans chapter 5 through 8 or 6 through 8. In Romans chapter 6, we're talking about the power of sin over the believer is broken by means of the believer's union with Christ and his death. Okay, the believer is dead to sin, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 7 is talking about the power of the law over the believer being broken by the same means. So Romans chapter 7, the believer is dead to the law, dead to sin, dead to the law. In Romans chapter 8, sanctification by the Spirit. Okay, so there's kind of like a theme going on here. The beginning of Romans, you know, we're talking about unregenerate people and, you know, talking about reprobates and all that. And uh, goes goes on and talks about talking about the believer, the new life in Christ. Romans chapter 6. Um, so there's another question in Romans chapter 7 I haven't really mentioned yet, but I'm going to go over. And who is the speaker in Romans chapter 7? Because there, the people can, you know, they can take that out of context or, or try to change it. Is it even Paul talking about himself? Um, so there's a few different ways that people look at it. Is one is that the I, which is being spoken of, means all humanity, rhetorical experience of everyone. Okay, that's, this is a rhetorical view of who the speaker is. Or... Number two, the I, the figure, rep is, is who represents, a figure who represents everyone. The I is a figure who represents everyone. This is the representative view. So the rhetorical view, the I represents, or the I is all humanity, experience of everyone. Or the re representative view, where the figure represents everyone. And, it, and peop, some people have tried to say that it's Paul identifying himself with Adam at the fall or the people of Israel at the time of the giving of the law. Okay? And the third view is that I is the speaker only. Paul talking about himself. That's the autobiographical view. So the rhetorical, the representative, the, or the autobiographical. The representative view has merit because it's used elsewhere. Um, and one of, the, one of the places we can see that is Romans chapter 11, verse 19. Romans chapter 11, verse 19, it says, But wilt thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Okay, so he's talking about the Gentiles as a nation. Um, not talking about himself. And it's pretty obvious, though, in this context, you know. Romans chapter 11, verse 19, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I, not Paul talking about himself, but as representing the Gentiles, that they might be grafted in. Okay? Would they be saying that? Um, so I hope you understand that. 
where he says, you know, he's saying I, talking about representing the Gentiles, not talking about himself. The rhetorical, that it, that it means everyone, the first view is implausible, and this is why. Because Paul uses I for himself in other places, in Romans chapter 15, verse 14, um, he says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So I, myself, clearly Romans 15 verse 14, he's, he's using it for himself. So he uses it for himself and, and, and many other times. Um, the depth and intensity of feeling and anguish in Romans chapter 7, verse 10, verse 11, verse 15, verse 23 seem to indicate Paul's personal experience. Okay. Um, and number three, the personal outcry and confession in verse 24 and 25. You know, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? Um, so, it seems to be way leaning more on on the autobiographical view that it's Paul speaking of himself. Um, so then the next question is Paul speaking of himself post conversion while he was still unregenerate, or is he speaking of himself after salvation? So let's I'm gonna first look at the arguments that people will try to use. And so I said that, you know, there's lots of heretics, people I've already marked, True Coro eight, Kerrigan Skelly, Jesse Morrell. Mike Desario, they all might have different arguments and stuff, so this is just kind of a general thing, and maybe in the future I'd like to go point to point, specifically expose their, their false, you know, their twisting of the context and whatnot. But this is a general thing, I'm sure that they use these arguments too. Um, so first of all is Paul's bondage to sin, or seemingly, okay. Um, Christians are no longer slaves to sin due to their union with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Um, in chapter 6, verse 2, 6, 11, and 18 through 22, Christians must no longer submit themselves to sin. It says, you know, don't submit yourself to sin. So Romans chapter 6, verse 2 says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Christians are liberated from sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 7 seems to speak of bondage in verse 14, verse 18, verse 23, and verse 25. Specifically verse 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now I've already explain this, that when he says, I am carnal, you know, by nature, this is his condition, this is all men's conditions, that we are born carnal, we are born sinful, conceived in sin, and that nature stays with us, okay? And when it says sold under sin, it means, you know, that all men were sold under sin since the fall. Um, but there are instances, you know, in the Bible where it says under sin uh, is for Unbelievers, like Galatians 3.10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. They are under the curse. So, um, But as I said, this is speaking of a condition, not a position. Uh, and also, complete deliverance is not yet. Paul still commands believers to yield to sin. Like we said, like I just said, um, Romans chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey, obey it in the lust thereof. So this shows that, you know, it is possible for saved people to obey sin still, to, to have that problem with sin. Verse 13, Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Obviously, it's possible of happening, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. The body is still in need of redemption. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. It has not happened yet. Still coming. Okay, so, you know, they'll say, well, the Christian's redeemed. How can he be under sin and stuff? Well, like I said, the under sin means, you know, all mankind since the fall, but also there is obviously still things that need to happen that are future, okay? 
In one sense, yes, they've already happened, but we're still awaiting them, okay? Already, but not yet. Um, okay, so, so the first argument that they use is that it seems that B Paul is under the bondage of sin, okay? And so for one, I said Romans chapter 7, verse 14, they take that out of context when it says that he's sold under sin. It doesn't mean some kind of current uh, position. And um, there's still need for redemption of the body. And there are verses that tell believers not to yield to sin, saying that it is possible. And so... And you know, these sinless perfection heretics, open theists, whatever, they'll, they destroy so many texts, they'll just destroy the whole Bible, because, you know, they'll teach conditional salvation too, that a person can lose salvation, and so they just, it's just like dominoes, they just destroy the Bible all throughout it. Um, destroy the character of God, destroy, you know, everything. Um, so it seems that Paul's in bondage, but that is, is not the case. Um, though it is possible for a Christian to still struggle with sin, there is still needs of further redemption of the body. They also try to make an argument with the structure of the text. Okay, They'll say that Romans chapter 7, verse 5 says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto God. So that's talking about before we were saved. Verse 6 says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So they try to say that verse, verse 5 is uh, equal with verse 14 through 25, that they're all speaking of unbelievers. Verse 6 is compared to verse or chapter 8, um, which just seems like a mess. Um, that's just... Uh, but it's better to see that chapter 5 and verse 6 is talking about, you know, before we were saved, now we're saved. It, it's better seen as a summary thus far. Um, from what's been being said so far, and is setting the stage for the next idea um, throughout. And they will also say that there's the, con the contrast between Romans 7 and verse 8. 7 would be talking about unsaved people, and verse 8 is talking about saved. But um, the contrast might have more to do with the saved person attempting to fill the obligations of the law through the power of their own finite resources in comparison with another believer attempting to fulfill God's righteous requirements throughout the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So it's saying kind of, um, you know... Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25 is talking about how um, the law is unable to sanctify man in, a, in and of itself. And, um, and if a man tries to fulfill the law with their old nature, you know, without the assistance of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't work. Um, but then Romans chapter 8 would be talking about using the Holy Spirit, you know, live, walking in the Spirit and such. So, um, What they're trying to do with the structure of the text and stuff is just really doesn't make any sense. And um, I mean, I do believe, you know, especially in prophetic books and stuff, the major prophets and Revelation and all that and prophecy. I, I don't believe everything in Revelation is in chronological order. And you know, there are things that need to be really looked into. But in the epistles and Romans and stuff, it's all pretty straightforward. You know, it shouldn't it shouldn't be that that messed up. That's really confusing. The way that they try to make it is just not the natural reading of the text. And so, for the absence of any mention of the Holy Spirit, okay. So in chapter eight, the Holy Spirit's mentioned many many times, you know, possibly nineteen times, and it's only used once in chapter seven. The spirit the spirit indwells all believers. Um, we learn that in Romans chapter eight. Um, it could be very well that the reason the Holy Spirit is not mentioned in Romans 7, 14-25 is because these verses are portraying a believer who is attempting to fill, fulfill the demands of the law through their own power. This stands in sharp contrast to the believer in chapter 8 who is attempting to fulfill demands of the law through God's power. 
So, and one last argument, which really isn't an argument, but it's always interesting to consider, but you have to watch out for people saying stuff like this, is the early church fathers. Apparently, many of the early church fathers thought that Romans chapter 7 was speaking of an unsafe person, specifically Origen. Uh, also, Augustine and Martin Luther in earlier times thought that this was speaking of an unsafe person, but later on they changed their views that it was speaking of a dual nature in the saved person. So really the church fathers, you know, they're probably not even saved. I'm sure they're in hell and uh, it doesn't mean squat really, but people might try to use that as an argument. Um, and that goes to show, you know, how, how problematic it is to, to look on these church fathers and stuff because they were wrong about all kinds of stuff. You know, and they were mostly, you know, Roman Catholics, or they, they came out of the Catholicism, but they still held on to a lot of things, and there's just so much wrong with them. You know, just because they're right about some things, or even right about many things, doesn't mean that they were saved. You know, even a, a completely lost person, you could blindfold them and take a wheel with one correct interpretation of Scripture, and, you know, nine, uh, you know, nine wrong interpretations and spin it and have them throw a dart and it could land on the right one. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, so, you know, but they're interesting to study and I do like to look at commentaries and stuff and, um, you know, even studying Calvinism, I mean, there's a lot that's right that, that these Calvinist, you know, fathers, whatever, that they taught, you know, the, the characteristics of God and stuff, a lot of things are right, you know, there's a lot that's completely wrong, too. But, uh, anyway, um, and another thing about Calvinism, which I'm doing a lot more study on, and I'm halfway through Dave Hunt's book, What Love Is This? But I really struggle to find something wrong with the perseverance of the saints. Um, there can be little things you can nitpick and say this and that. You know, I've heard it said that it should be the preservation of the saints because God preserves the saints, and I agree with that. But even the Calvinists don't teach that you must preserve to stay saved or to be saved. Perseverance is, um, you know, perseverance is the evidence of salvation that a person perseveres in the, in the faith. And I believe that's biblical because there are verses that say, you know, if you continue in the faith, those who are saved will continue in the faith. Those who are saved will bear fruit. Those who are saved will have good works. So, um, you know, not everything about Calvinism is wrong, but I mean, a lot of it is. A lot of their main points and stuff is definitely heretical. And there's no reason I should believe anyone who teaches that to be saved. But... Anyways, I guess I'm digressing, but so the church fathers, they can use that, not really noteworthy. But so I'll go through they, what, how they'll try to say that this is speaking of an unregenerate person is that sounds like Paul's in bondage to sin. Um, sounds like Paul's in bondage to sin. And also. The structure of the text, they try to twist things. The contrast between seven and eight, they try to say that one's a saved person, another's a, one's a saved, one's an unsaved person, chapter seven, chapter eight's a saved person. But like I said, this whole context, like from Romans five or Romans six to eight, is talking about the life of a believer. Like Romans chapter six says, you're dead to the sin, dead to sin. Romans chapter seven, you're dead to the law. It seems that it's all talking about, you know, saved people, the new life. You know, the beginning of Romans is talking about unsaved people, so it would seem odd to for him to, to throw that in the middle there. And um, the absence of any mention of the Holy Spirit. You know, well, that's just that's not the focus of this chapter. And then the early church fathers. So it seems like Paul's in bondage. The, the, they try to try to make it sound like their structure of the text sounds better when it doesn't. Um, and the absence of the mention of the Holy Spirit. And these things, you know, don't really cause problems for the view that, that Paul is saved. So now let's get into the arguments that this is why I'm really doing the study. And I hope that you'll take notes on these and try to remember these. These are what we need to know. So when we say that Romans chapter 7 is speaking of, of Paul as a saved man, you know, we need to learn these arguments so that we will know how to defend this. This is really why I'm doing the study. We're getting down to this final, final points here, which is still quite a bit. But 
So this would be the post-conversion view of Romans chapter 7. This is Paul speaking of himself as a saved man, still struggling with sin, still having that inward nature with him, the dual nature of the believer. Okay, so number one, one of the main arguments, um, the past tense... Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 13 has um, past tense verbs, and Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25 has present tense verbs, okay? And that's very notable, and at the beginning of this video, I'll have True Core 08 saying some stuff, and he'll just try to, they'll just try to kind of dismiss this, and uh, they'll try to say that the, the present tense verbs in verse 14 through 25 is like a historical present tense. Like he's speaking of the present tense as if, you know, he was before he was saved. Um, but it, that's just completely confusing. You know, <laughs> it's, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So, um, um, So 7 through 13, we got past tense verbs, you know, like, for without the law, sin was dead to me. You know, there was a time when I was, al I was alive without the law once, you know, like past tense. And then 14 through 25, it's all present tense. I am carnal. Um, I do that which I would not. Um, you know, so... Just look at that and you'll see that in verse 7 through 13 is a past tense verbs. Verse 14 through 25 is present tense. And that's a big evidence for why this is Paul speaking of himself as a believer in his present condition at the time of writing this. So, uh, number two, the second argument is... The desire to keep God's law in verse 15, verse 16, and 18 through 21. Romans 8, 7 says the unregenerate man is at enmity with God. Romans 3, 11 says the unregenerate do not understand or seek to keep God's law. Romans 8, 5 through 8, they hate God. They don't keep His law. Okay? Um, so, you know, verse 15 says, For that which I do allow, for that which I do, I allow not, but that, that what I would, that I do not. So he has this desire to keep God's law, and he's upset when he's failing to do so. Um, in verse 16, you know, I consent that the law is good. Um, I do that which I would not. I don't want to do these things. I want to to live right. Um, I don't want to break the law. Verse 18 through 21, you know, the same idea. So, I hope that you understand that. And the inward man is, uh, the inward, the inner person, Romans 7 verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. This, this, makes it even more evident that this is talking about a Christian experience, okay? Um, the inward man is always said of Christians. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Speaking of Christians. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Okay? So, Romans chapter 7, verse 22, For I delight, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. This has to be Paul speaking as a Christian. Okay? The theme in Romans 7 is the mind is on the side of obedience to God. Romans chapter 7, verse 23 and 25. Okay. Um, so he wants to serve the, the, the law of God. Um, Romans chapter 12. Uh, the renewed mind is a characteristic of a Christian. You know, we see that in Romans chapter 12, 2 and Ephesians 4, 23. Um, so... 
The pre-conversion people who say this is unregenerate man, they have a counter-argument for this, and they'll say that unregenerate Jews pursue the law for righteousness. In Romans 9, 31-32, we see that, and they have a zeal for God, Romans 10, verse 2. And Paul had a religious zeal before salvation, Galatians chapter 1, verse 13-14, through 14, and Philippians chapter 3, verse 4-6. through 6. However, they did not truly delight in God's law, but instead they sought to establish their own righteousness. Okay, big difference. Some say that it is possible for unbelievers to delight in God's law because He places His laws in the heart of people regardless of whether they were saved or not. Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. But these verses do not teach that the unbeliever has delight in them or seeks to follow them. So their arguments don't really measure up. Okay. So, argument number one, the past tense changes to a present tense. Uh, argument number two, the desire to keep God's law and the inward man. Um, speaking of a saved person. Argument number three, view toward the law. Paul says that the law is holy and righteous in verse 12, and spiritual in verse 14, and good in verse 19. Okay? Um, verse or Romans chapter eight verse seven says the unregenerate are hostile to God's law. Apparently, he has a different view on it. Speaking as a saved person. Okay. Argument number four: the desire to be rescued. Chapter seven verse twenty-four is a cry. Is it is it is a desire um, for a future time when. He will be redeemed from this, uh, not a cry of despair. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 23 talks about waiting for the redemption of the body. Some say uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 24 is a cry for salvation, but it's just as likely to be for sanctification or glorification. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's not despair. Okay, he says, I thank God. Through Christ our Lord, he knows who will deliver him, and that it is a guarantee that it will happen. Um, argument number five, the similarity between Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25, and Galatians 5. This is another big argument on the, the side of the, pre, the post-conversion. Um, Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, that ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Okay? So it's the same thing. It talks about a struggle here. You cannot do the things that you would. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Okay? Um, the exact same idea here. Talking to save people, okay? That it is still possible to fulfill the lust of the flesh because it is still there. That inward man is still there. Um, so that's a great argument. Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 15, compared with Galatians 5. Chapter six or verse sixteen through eighteen. The sixth argument that Romans chapter seven is talking about a post conversion Paul as a saved man is the duality between the two eyes. On one hand, it says there is nothing good within, verse eighteen, and then it delights in God's law, um, chapter or verse twenty two, um, Romans. 7.25 says, So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Okay, there's a duality, uh, you know, both going on at the same time here. But the unbeliever is completely under sin. Okay, Romans chapter 3 verse 9 says, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Um, so there is no struggle there. They're, they're completely sinful. Um, not like what's being talked about here. Um, number seven, the overall argument flow. 
Romans chapter 5 through chapter 8 talk about various aspects of the new life. Okay, In Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25, could be that the law is not able to sanctify in and of itself. So, um, you know, because Romans chapter 7 is talking about the, um, the role of the law in the life of the believer, that the believer is dead to the law. Okay, and so... That's the overall argument works on the side of post-conversion. The anticlimactic nature of Romans 7, 25b, okay? So we have this whole, this talking about all the struggle of sin and all that, and you know, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. That seems kind of anticlimactic if this was all talking about an unbeliever, um, because you would think that he would end it on the note with, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But then it goes on after that. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. That would seem like he would be going going back to uh, talking about an unregenerate person again by their uh, views, those who would say that this is an unregenerate man. But, you know, Paul returns to the tension of verses 14 through 25 and, and, 20, and, and 25b, rather than ending the pericope on a note of victory, reverting to the tension following the exclamation of thanksgiving suggests that the deliverance available through Christ does not eliminate the ongoing struggle with sin and the Christian experience. In other words, if 725a furnishes the solution, how can Paul revert to a statement of the problem in 25b? Okay, um, so I hope that you understand that. Um, and Another thing that's kind of like the church father's thing is that we can't really totally use as an argument, but, you know, is uh, personal experience. All of us, brothers and sisters, who are truly saved, we've repented of our sins, you know, submitted to Christ's lordship, believe in him for our salvation. We know that there has been an ongoing struggle with sin that continues after we're saved, and we still commit sins, okay? Um, but we don't live a lifestyle of sin. We're no longer sinners. We are saints now. We live holy, but we are not without sin. Only Christ was without sin. We still have that struggle. We still have the inward man. We can completely relate to this. And um, we know that those who teach sinless perfection are liars, that they are deceived. Um, so, you know, we can't really use personal experiments as an argument. I'd rather use, you know, big, biblical, you know, interpretation, exegesis, whatever you want to say. Uh, you know, that's, that's the good, that's the best argument. Um, not really using personal experience, but we know per, from our personal experience that, uh, that we have the dual natures and, um, so, I mean, this is a really important study, and uh, we need to we need to know these arguments. So, I'll go over the post-conversion arguments again. Past tense to present tense. The desire to keep God's law must be speaking as a Christian. The view towards the law, that it is holy, it's spiritual, it's good. Uh, no unsaved person would think that. Um, the desire to be rescued, okay? Romans 7.24 is desire, not despair. Um, the similarity between Romans 7 and Galatians 5, uh, verse 16 through 18. The duality between the two eyes. The overall argument flow. The anticlimactic nature of Romans 7, 25b. So, we do have a dual nature. Even though we are saved, we are not completely redeemed yet. Okay, we are, but it's still yet to come. Um, when this corruptible body will put on incorruption. Um, you know, we still live in our mortal bodies. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to finish here. It's probably a really long video. <laughs> uh, it's taken me quite a while to, to study this and feel comfortable to go through this, but I uh, hope I hit all the points. I'm sure I missed something, but I thought it's getting pretty dry here, so <laughs> I'm going to end it. Uh, thanks for watching, and look forward to the next study. I have another big study like this coming up, and it kind of has to deal with this as well. So.
Uh, thanks for watching, and God bless. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.